Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak with you today. Uh, I kind of put together a presentation hodgepodge from a, many other presentations that I've done. So if there's any in, inconsistency in the font and layout of the slides, please bear with me. I did my best to correct everything, but you'll find some glitches. Um, uh, just one thing about uh, myself before I start, I'm, I'm going to make a small little statement and then we'll get into the, the slides and I'll try and go through them in a very fluid way without giving too much information because it's a lot and many of you may, um, this may be the first time for you to be exposed to uh, a, an overall global view of the photographic heritage. Uh, in Egypt. So generally when I, when I, uh, I used to teach at AUC photography and when I would start the class I would introduce the students to the idea of the object, the photograph as, as an object and the print culture that is around photography and unfortunately I didn't bring that precise example for you today but we can talk about it later. Just to begin, um, even though we are, I'm going to be presenting, by the end of the presentation, we'll get an idea of how contemporary artists uh, access photographic archives and how they engage with the material. But we're going to start first with uh, a brief history of the historical record, just so that we can understand the medium uh, from its beginnings, its potentiality, and then we can move on to uh, how the artists engage and respond to the medium and look at multiple trajectories in contemporary works of art. Uh, because of the time limitations, I'll just focus on portraiture as a genre in the photography that we're, we'll be looking at. And I'll guide you uh, in, in a way of looking at the material. So I'm always interested uh, in photography from the point of creation, from the point of the producer, the production of the, the image, the use of that image, its currency, so its value, how it moves around, especially today, and the various ways that we engage with our, in quotations, photographic heritage. So I'll be starting from the beginning, which is 1840s, which is about 185 years ago. That's it. I'm not going to start before that, even though it is relevant to how the first images were created. Um, and this is not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. It's a massive list of practitioners that have been uh, working and producing in Egypt. It's, um, yeah, Egypt is one of the most photographed countries in the world, and I know this is kind of a general statement and maybe a little bit uh, patriotic, but it's actually quite connected to the development of the technology of photography. So Egypt is central to photography in a very important way, even though we don't really know much about it ourselves as Egyptians living in this country. Um, so importantly, and this is also one of my current activities. Many of you have already visited me at the gallery, but we have a photography gallery in Zamalek, so you're all welcome to visit. We have an interesting library that you can access. We do have some uh, historic collections, and we can give you a, a tour if you'd, if you'd like to come and visit us during any of our exhibitions. And one of your professors has a show on now, so you have to come. <laughs> um, so, even though we don't have a very clear understanding of what our history is uh, in the development of our practices in photography, so your archive is trying to look at e Egyptian design archive, how Egyptians have their fingerprint or their uh, sensibility on how this material is coming out. And you have to look at how um, these things were influenced. So we don't have this information. We don't have an, 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 a way to calculate or even propose a theory of what might be considered a local lens or an Egyptian aesthetic in photography. We only have elements uh, of the complete picture, but we are lucky at this moment because even though we have this push 
uh, for decolonization in different spaces and different fields, we have an opportunity now to start inquiring. We have the, the will also to engage with that, as with this project. So um, we might be able to come up with what could be an Egyptian photographic practice. So the examples I'll show today of the contemporary artists are all nationalities. They're not just Egyptians, even though they are Egyptian in their practice. So we'll, we'll you know, unpack that as we go through uh, the slides. So, um, so let's start. So the first, photo, the first photographs that were produced on Egypt were really about uh, um, documenting the monuments. So this is after, you know, at least a century of draftspeople, uh, painters, uh, different artists coming and trying to document the country. And all of these photographs have to have a place to sit. And so they were produced in albums, big books that you can look through. And so these books were produced uh, in limited quantities and sold in Europe for very, very high prices, even compared to the value of money today. Um, Maxime Ducamp is one of them, and a lot of these slides will give you some information at the bottom of where this photograph is collected, the size of it, so this is quite small, it's 21 by 16 centimeters, and the medium, so this is a calotype uh, album of photographs. Calotype is, a, is another process. I'm not going to go into all of the different processes, but just to give you an idea of how uh, these things were put together. So this is more of Maxime Ducamp. And this is how it would appear on a page with a handwritten caption and some kind of cataloging number and the, the binding of one of these books. So this is just a brief list of the first albums that came out of Egypt in the first 20 years of the medium. And this is what created a market for images of Egypt. And this is how tourism actually began. The word tourist comes from the grand tour of Europeans taking steamships and uh, moving through the Mediterranean and passing through countries like Egypt and Palestine, uh, Turkey, Greece, uh, Italy. This is where the first photographers came and this is where their industry began. So uh, the in, I'm just going to talk and you can look at the slides and the information. So the industry of photography were businesses. Some were small, some were large. Uh, they worked with the first tools of photography, the different practices, paper negatives, uh, calotype prints, uh, collodial uh, plates, uh, platinum palladium, different kinds of salted prints. So this is before silver gelatin, before the introduction of silver into the technique of creating a photographic image or, or fixing the light, as they call it, onto a, a surface, a permanent surface. So a lot of these photographers are privately collected. We don't have a museum in the country where we can go and see the progression of how these people worked. There are plenty of historical photography books that you can take a look at uh, that will give you brief histories of how these people were introduced to the medium of photography because they didn't study at school. They were already practicing other uh, fields before they came to photography. But the way that they constructed the image, how they created a viewpoint for us to look like was highly influenced from where they came from and what their own personal experiences were. So it's, it's worthwhile to, to check it out. Le Kijian is kind of an important photographer for us here in Egypt. He created uh, several studios and stayed quite a while. And so we'll see lots of his material in the market here in Egypt. In the market, I mean like uh, Sul Ezbekeya and flea markets and things like that. Antonio Beato, sorry, there's a spelling mistake. Uh, he, he had a moving dark room or a floating dark room that would go up and down the Nile in Luxor. And you can see how the practice of photography became 
commercial en masse. So the creation of postcards that uh, tourists would buy on location and then travel back home to them with them. So a lot of these postcards you'll find in family collections all over the world. More examples of how they created commercial images of Egypt, not documentary. These are commercial fantasy images of Egypt with using different techniques. The central image is also Le Gidjian, and he uses this background for most of his work, so you'll begin to look at, you'll begin to recognize the backgrounds of the photographs that you see, and you'll see that these are intentionally made. So you see the same background. So this is kind of the image, uh, the image of places or scenes and people or types. This is a very anthro anthropological approach. Uh, the image on the left, uh, we have the original of this at the gallery and you're welcome to come and take a look at it. This, by contrast, this is uh, some work that we, that one of our young collectors has been collecting from his own family across the country. And so it's during the same time as the previous images that we just saw, but it gives you a, a contrasted view of real people as opposed to fabricated people. So this is his family five, six generations ago. More of Le Jen. so you see how Le Jen is also uh, falling uh, the tradition of commercial practices by creating a specific image that is put onto the market. Other photographers doing the same thing. And then we get to Leonard and Landrock. And this is a big story for Egypt. They've been open since 1924, but before that they spent uh, they opened in 1904 in Tunisia and then stopped for a while because of World War II and then opened up here, World War I, I'm sorry, and then uh, opened up practice in Cairo. They closed their business or transferred ownership of their business in 2016, so that's quite a long run for a business, a photographic business, to stay in operation and their business is to sell photographs. So they're selling their own production. Leonard was the photographer, Landrock was the business person. Uh, so they were selling Leonard's pictures in addition to photographs that they collected from some of the earlier photographers that we saw in the previous slides. So their collection is not just their own. It's kind of like an archive already. And just to show you how the same image was just reproduced over and over again for decades, the same image of an Egyptian woman being propagated into the commercial space. So this is also print culture, how it's uh, different forms of printing, uh, coloring, uh, selenium toned, uh, different practice. Some of them are offset, some of them are lithographic. Um, and this is, what their bookstore used to look like. They've now moved, so it doesn't have the same appeal, but this is a setup for selling images. The Egyptian version, this is Gaddis uh, under the stairs at the uh, Winter Palace Hotel in Luxor. They're open since 1907. They're still open, so how many years is that? Uh, they're also in the business of selling photographs at Ateya Geddes, he was a young boy when Antonio Beato was working in Luxor, and he was trained by Beato. And when Beato uh, passed away, he left all of his equipment to Geddes. And during this time, you know, we are always asking, well, why, is, why were there not Egyptian photographers? Why were they just foreign photographers? Well, the laws at the time, you have to go back into kind of the, the commercial practices and commercial laws of the country, it was virtually impossible for Egyptians to import uh, materials and equipment. And so it was the foreigners who had access. Many of them had diplomatic uh, ease uh, with things. And so they were able to bring uh, equipment and material into the country and then the left some things behind for Egyptians to follow their their footsteps. This is also display in Luxor at their bookshop, selling images. 
their archive also contains images from the previous photographers. So we're talking about decades earlier, so images that were created in 1870, 1880. This is how they sell their images. So the, the work on the left are actually original uh, postcards that were printed in the 20s and 30s and 50s. So you can see a change in the printing technology that was used. These are two images of the glass plate negatives, which are stored at the bookshop. And then you also have the fantasy images. So these are women dressing up as fallahin. These are city, urban, middle-class women dressing up. If you look at the background, you'll see the same background happening. So the, uh, and the pictures, the, center, the central picture is my grandmother. And the one on her right is her mother, my great-grandmother. And this is my grandmother in the same studio. Look at the background. It's the same studio, just used differently, right? So this is how we start to look at the photographs that we encounter. This is why I'm showing you in this, in this way. Also, Le Kijian, he's, uh, you know, photographing schools, the police academy, the army, uh, different college graduations. And so even though we're looking at kind of a glamorized image of Egypt through some of the portraiture, we're also looking at different ways of showing the modernity in the country and how people are engaging in their daily life. We're not talking about an ancient culture or uh, ancient monuments or, you know, Islamic Cairo, etc. We're talking about a modern people. Selim Youssef, he was a downtown, uh, he had a studio downtown uh, Cairo, uh, also ID photographs of soldiers in the army during World War II. And the text below is just really, really tiny sliver of information of what other studios were uh, appearing at that time. That's a whole other conversation, doing a survey of the studio uh, photography businesses all over the country since the beginning until now. It's hundreds and hundreds of names. Uh, and there are different periods that show up as patterns of where there was kind of what I call explosions of Egyptian studios coming onto the scene. So here you see uh, Zazi and Asyut and Mansoura, Alexandria, more of Selim Youssef, and he was photographing the people of downtown. So these are the community and quite a, a mixed heritage, mixed identity of community, living in downtown Cairo. And he also has a very specific style. You can recognize his style of photographs. He didn't sign or stamp most of them, but you can recognize the way he uses the light and how he prints. Studio Kirop. Kirop was a business that was passed down father to son. And Kirop Jr. passed away maybe five years ago. Alban, uh, he's also downtown. When he passed away, his wife took over, Shake, and so she began photographing and signing double signatures on the photographs. But he's an example of the photograph uh, artist, how the photo photographer is beginning to think of himself as an artist, not just as a documentarian. Studio Garo. Garo Jr. also closed the studio, I think, in the 90s or early 2000s. They had a branch in Heliopolis. This is Garo Sr. at his own exhibition in the 1940s at the Intercontinental Hotel that it was the old uh, Opera Square downtown. So he put on his own exhibition, and he was known at the time for photographing cinema stars. Unknown photographers, beach photography was a big cultural thing until today, actually. You'll find beach photographers. Uh, people love to do that. So the image on the left is from a camera Maya, which is a paper negative camera. Again, we can talk about that another time. And then the one on the, on the right is hand colored directly onto the silver gelatin print. 
Iqbal Hineen, part of the Arts and Freedom Group, uh, Alban also, so experimenting with what photography can do. You know, they are now artists, they're operating in an art space rather than a commercial space. Yahya Arif, uh, some of his photographs entered photography competitions in the UK in the 1930s. So again, it's another example of someone who was engaging with an artistic space. Van Leo, of course, his self-portraits and hand-painted work was a big influence for other artists to come. Van Leo in his studio. And some of us actually saw Van Leo. Sally, you met Van Leo, yeah? I don't think I did. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there are many of us who spent time in this studio with Van Leo before he passed away in the early 2000s. So the photographic display that you see in the reception had stayed the same. Studio Photo Star. This is a studio, uh, this is a, a box of negatives that we found uh, ourselves. So we have the negatives at the gallery. And so these are positives made from the negatives. So it's just a regular community studio in Sayyidah Zainab in the 1960s and 70s. Again, regular people, look at the background, it's like a European style background. Studio Rifat, he's a special character. He's coming from Bulaq area, Rod al Farag area, and he's very uh, dedicated to hand painting on his photographs. And Studio Bella, which closed, it was downtown quite, until quite recently. Studio Antro, also another business handed down father to son. And Antro was also kind of an interesting character. He was the uh, photographer for Sadat, and he created a whole series of himself. He's pretending that he's taking a light meter reading in the photograph, and he's making a, a self-portrait with his sitters. So Pope Shenouda on the, on the right, <laughs> President Sadat on the left, unknown general in the center. He's hilarious. <laughs> so, you, so they have personalities, right? A lot of these, uh, uh, you know, an entro Armenian, right? Many of them are Armenian, but they're all naturalized Egyptians since the 40s. So they are part of the package, right? We are a mixed group of people, and you can see that within the photographs of the community. So after looking at all of that history, now we're going to look at what artists are doing with that knowledge. How do they look at it, and how do they incorporate it into their work? And I know I've gone way over time, probably. Um, so we're going to look at how they respond to the archive and the traditions. We're going to look at how they reinterpret it through their own self-portraiture, so how they respond to it intimately on, a, on, a, on the position of the self. How they curate found archives, how they develop, delve into their own families and, and draw out different narratives, and how sometimes they become the archive themselves. And this is just a really brief run through. There are many, many, many more names than this, but it just gives you an idea of what's going on. Osama Asid, he used to live in Cairo and he was teaching other photographers on uh, analog practices, non-silver practices. And so you can see how he's responding to, to the tradition of imagery. These are hand-painted in some cases. Brian E. Dunn, who was also a professor here at one point, and she's also responding to the tradition of the mobile studio in addition to the monuments and sites of interest. Yusuf Nabil, uh, who doesn't live in Cairo anymore, but he started with the image on the left. This was one of his first published images in the late 90s, uh, responding very much or very much intimately learning from Van Leo. And all of his work until today is the same. Yusuf, uh, Nabil Botros. Nabil is also responding to the idea of the self, the Egyptian, 
in photography. So the series on the left is him having dressing up and uh, photographing himself like the photomaton machine. And it took him more than two years to do this project because he had to keep growing his beard and cutting his beard and dyeing his hair and changing his appearance. On the right is a series that he did in the late, the early 90s. I mean, they're all silver gelatin prints and they're portraits of workers and regular Egyptians on the streets. More of the Egyptian portraits. So again, you see the contrast between the studio constructed image, the fantasy, the glamour, and then the real people. Suzanne Hafuna, uh, also responding to her own heritage, a German Egyptian, uh, going back to the Delta, looking at paper negatives and how images were produced. Yasser Elwen, also formerly from GUC, and he's directly talking about the tradition of photography, the mobile studio. And this is the camera maya on the right-hand side. An exhibition that, that took place in 2012 that I co-curated with another artist. And this, you'll see some familiar images that you've seen before in the presentation. And it was an exhibition about studio practice. Uh, we had a working studio in the heart of the exhibition where people could actually take pictures of themselves or have their photograph taken, I mean. And what I didn't bring today, unfortunately, was the, the stamp that we used, Studio Viennoise, the envelope where you could come and take your photograph after the photographer developed it the following week, uh, the business card, everything was uh, Studio Viennoise. We had a Facebook page, we had a phone number, you could call for an appointment, and this went on way past the end of the exhibition. So the, the image on the left is a real couple coming for their wedding photograph. So Barry Iverson. Barry is interesting because he was an intimate friend of Van Leo, so he learned uh, to adopt the hand-painted uh, photograph technique but he also is a collector in addition to being a photographer. So this work was his way of resolving his own Egyptianness, his position in this country since the early or late 70s, basically. So he's also asking us a question. What do we remember or what do we recognize about our own heritage? How much of it is made up and how much of it is actually real? So these are all montages on the computer and then printed and then hand colored. And this is an image from the exhibition. In the center of the exhibition with the contemporary work on the wall, we had a historical display of the, some of the originals that he drew inspiration from so that the audience could understand the link between the history of photography and how uh, contemporary, it affects contemporary practice. <laughs> so ag again, the, the types of scenes and, and people. And he also had an album, so it goes back again, responding to the tradition of photographic album. Nirmin Hammam, um, prominent Egyptian artist. She always works with photography as a base to her work. And then she does a lot of collage or montage on the computer. Uh, this is her last uh, body of work called Aru, which is coming from the ancient Egyptian word for paradise. And this is obviously a critique, a kind of a dystopian image or vision of how we are, are, are living, how are we um, protecting or not protecting our environment. And the whole series is based on beach photography from found archives. So it's quite a complex work.
Meha Ma'moun with uh, Still from Domestic Tourism. Again, she sourced uh, film clips with the pyramids as a central um, position in the image. Hal al Qusi al Arshif. Uh, this was shown, I guess, more than 10 years ago when there was a biennial called uh, Photo Cairo, not Cairo Photo Week, which is part of Photopia, but Photo Cairo, which was a CIC townhouse gallery joint venture, which was a festival of contemporary <coughs> photography. And so this was her approach to, to del finding material. She, after that, she created a Facebook page called Photomastr, where she's posting a lot of uh, found images. This is from uh, Mged Naguib's uh, exhibition at Townhouse, also called The Past is Always an Invented Land. So he is a collector. He collects all things, everything. And he literally filled up the whole factory space at the townhouse gallery with all kinds of stuff. And it's all juxtapos juxtapositioned with each other in kind of a nonsensical way, but then you begin to see what is going on once you spend a little bit of time there. Uh, this is a, a paper that I did for a journal looking at where do we find landscape photography in family archives? And how are Egyptians responding to their own landscape? What is the notion of leisure and recreation and travel and how they're documenting themselves? So these are vernacular photographs or photographs taken by regular people. Amina Qaddus, City Entrapped, she's finding photographs all throughout the city. So there's something circular that's happening within the image and how she's uh, looking at how people are responding or inhabiting spaces in the city. Another series of, um, from Amina Qaddus having to deal with her grandmother, her grandparents' house coming from the heritage of a cotton producing family. Another series of, from Amina Qaddus, if my grandfather would have written me a letter. So she has postcards made and uh, available for the audience in this space, but she's really recreating a very intimate space with all of the found photographs from her family. Uh, this is a work I did a long time ago, looking at uh, diaspora and immigration in Egypt. So images from the 60s and 70s from Egypt and North America. And if you look at the images on the left, the images of Egypt, you'll find commercial slides that were available. And so in a way, this was, how, this was one way my parents could explain where they came from to a North American audience. So they would buy commercial slides available at the Egyptian Museum in Tahrir. So they show dates, they show the beach, they show Mugamma, they show kind of critical points of reference. This was the installation view. Along with the installation, there was an audio recording because my family would send oral letters, recorded letters to each other back and forth in the 60s and 70s, first by the reel-to-reel -reel tape, quarter-inch tape, and then by cassette. And these tapes would go back and forth and then be recorded over and over again. So there was a, an edited audio that was being uh, projected in the space along with a, a moving slide uh, carousel so you could hear the Kodak slide machine moving. Ibrahim Ahmad, he's looking at self-portraiture in the studio and he's doing handmade collages. So this is not a reproducible image. It's not something that you can print. It is a collage. It's handmade and it's a unique piece. Each piece is unique. So he's photographing, printing the photographs. He has a huge stack of them and then he draws, he selects from them and melds it and cuts them and splices them together. So the two on the left are 
his own self-portrait in the studio. It's a very uh, psychoanalytic, it's very uh, deep in its psychological process. And the, la the right side is he's beginning to introduce images from his family's archive into his own image and blending them together. Some things seem forgotten. So he's trying to understand the trajectory of his family, how they moved from country to country, what his relationship was with his father. They were five brothers in the family. So it's a, it was something deep for him to unpack. So all of this work is very personal, and yet it talks about imperialistic uh, uh, Im Im impositions on the body, on manhood, on identity. So it operates on two levels. Sara Salem, looking at uh, grieving for the loss of her grandmother, but also contemplating her Egyptianness in relation to the ancient culture. So she's melding images of her grandmother onto monuments. And she's saying to us as Egyptians, we need to consider the ancient people like our ancestors, like our grandmothers. So she has a, a whole other project, I'm not showing it here, about the mummies and the display of human remains. Heba Khalifa, this is from a series that she's been working on for quite a while. It's also a very, very internal process, looking at the traumas of her childhood, growing up as a girl in Egypt. So it's all about her own self-image and manipulating that. Uh, using collage by hand, collage or montage on the computer, hand-painted elements. And last is Marwan Dewey, where the, this work was produced in the early 70s till the early 90s, so kind of a 20-year period of these abstract nudes. And because he worked so long and because the work resonates to a more global uh, artistic canon in photography, he in fact becomes his own archive in a way. He is looking back at his work and repositioning it today, which is what we generally do with photography now that we have a, a space in time or an opportunity to look back and reassess the images that were produced. I think that's it. That's it. Thank you.